that. And this is our teaching and learning call for August 3rd. I believe we're in August already. This year is just like most of them. They keep going faster and faster every year, I think. Um, all right, so let me go ahead and share my screen just so we've got something to look at. Um, so as far as announcements go, SakaiCon recordings are available if you didn't already get the uh, email that went out to all attendees. Um, those are up. There's a playlist on the um, Sakai YouTube channel, so you can see all of the recordings there. Or if you go back into the Sakai Con site on Try Sakai, we left it open for people. Um, the links are embedded there. So where the join session links used to be, there's a view recording link for the, the actual session. You can get to them in either location. Um, the, oh, another announcement that I forgot to put on here is um, that Sakai 22.1 came out last week, I think it was. Um, and so that's out and available if anybody was waiting on the dot one release. Um, it's, it's out in the wild now. Um, and I think the next release is going to be 21.4, um, which should be soon. Um, and then the, there might be one more release in the 20 line. The 20.6 will be the last one. I'm not sure exactly when that's coming, but it should be fairly soon. Um, so if you were at the PMC call yesterday, uh, Earl went over all the release dates. So it's just kind of a recap for folks. Um, so those are all my announcements. Uh, does anybody else have any announcements? Okay, um, so we'll go ahead and move on to our agenda. Um, it's a fairly short agenda so far, but I did have a section on, on the front. I figured it would probably take us maybe 10 minutes max um, to talk about uh, community guidelines for conversations, and then we'll um, go into JIRAs. So far, there's only one JIRA that's been suggested, but we can uh, you know, do look at the filter and see if there's any others that pop up that look interesting. Um, so the com conversations community guidelines, if you've been into the conversations tool, you may have seen um, that there's an option there for the instructor to enable community guidelines. And, um, and the, the instructor has control over what that says. There's a, a text box that they can edit. Um, but we wanted to provide something for people to start with so it wasn't just blank. Um, so the team at Duke that we've been working with to develop um, the, uh, the tool came up with this. This um, is largely based on some of their codes of conduct that they have um, just for general use in, in, in their courses. Um, but we kind of distilled it down and made it um, somewhat generic so that it could fit a, you know, a wide variety of use cases. Again, it's customizable. This would just be the default text. And um, it would be the default text for an institution, but if the institution had their own that they wanted to be the default instead, you know, you can always go into the message bundle manager and change things. And so potentially that would be a place where you could put your custom default um, instead. But anyway, so we wanted to just kind of run this past folks on the teaching and learning call to see if you think this is a good default statement or if you think it needs any tweaks. Um, so the statement here as as written is respect that others opinions and beliefs may differ from your own. If you disagree, you may critique the idea, but not the person. Use inclusive language when referring to others. Avoid assumptions about others, especially based on their perceived social groups and identities. So that we just kind of left it at that as a starter. Um, so, what do you guys think about that? It sounds open-ended enough. Yeah. And simple uh, in the sense that it's not long and lengthy. Right, right. Yeah, we didn't want this huge community guideline statement. If somebody wants to get detailed, they could certainly do so. No, that's, that's beautifully done. Whoever wrote it, very, very nice. Yep. Yeah. yeah, Jennifer, they can modify, an individual instructor can modify it or the institution could modify the default. 
and it's per class. So every instance of conversations can have its own guidelines. All right. So, um, okay, good. I, I was hoping that you guys would agree that it's a good statement. Um, so I did have a couple of questions for the, for the teaching and learning group about this is, um, well, the first one we've kind of already covered. People seem to like it and no suggestions for things that you want to add. Thing missing, maybe you want to leave that to the instructor. I think it sounds fine. Okay, cool. Um, one question that came up is that uh, they wanted to know if teaching and learning should periodically review the default guideline text over time. Um, Personally, I didn't think that was necessary because we don't do that for anything else. <laughs> but, you mean put it yeah. on a yearly review? <laughs> yeah, and, and I told him, I'm like, we're not that systematic. <laughs> no. But um, but I, you know, they're like, well, can you pose the question? I'm like, all right, I'll ask. <laughs> um, I mean, my, yeah, I guess we could review it every year, but man, that would be a lot of. Yeah, that's a lot of text lot. to review. And then you got to Well, not only that, but. The, depending upon the instance and whether or not people are actually using conversations or not at the time. I mean, we still have 20.6 that's supposed to be coming out sometime soon, which doesn't have conversations. Right. You know, so it's like, are we reviewing it to eke out a gnat of, 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 you know, usefulness? Yeah. And I mean, it's pretty general as written and people can modify it internally. So they might not even be using the same one. This is just the default. Right. So. Anyway, so I think we don't need to review it periodically. This I am in agreement that we do not need to review it periodically. So put it on here. Like you did. So. Okay. Um, so any other thoughts on the community guidelines before we move on? Um, I think my only concern would be I ran it through a readability checker and it kind of it has it really high on the grade level and scale level and it's not very readable. That's true. I, I do I understand what Matthew's saying. That's true. There's a lot of um, difficult it says there's almost twenty percent difficult words and things like that. So I don't know how accessible the guidelines are. So hmm. usually that's you a really good almost, point. At like a yeah. five, like a fifth fifth or sixth grade rate level, even though we're kind of I know Sakai is typically used in higher ed, but it seems like it may be, you know, a little I don't know, a little too high level text. That's, but I don't know how I would change it or, you know, simplify it, I guess. Maybe a little too. That's. Just, just seeing it initially. I, I, I understand when you read it, but when I look at it on, on either pad, I'm like, um, it just, a blob of text for me. So can you I think like, of ways to reword it or should we just say that we thought it was too high level? Hmm. We can workshop it a little bit if we can come up yeah. with a better version of it. Yeah. I think it might be good to workshop it um, just because having something that's too high level is likely to turn off a lot of people if they feel it's like okay that's you know useless to me and I, I i see it easier if we can make it at a little more easy to understand level but find a balance there where it's not feeling you know patronizing right yeah, I'm thinking maybe some bullets too, just to kind of break it up visually. Mm. 
Yeah, short, short bullet statements yeah, to kind of make it distinct points and reword them slightly as well. But yeah, the the uh, the the flesh reading ease. I read, I, I pasted that uh, a website I used, and it says there's a there's a flesh score, and it says it's it's a uh, it's rated as insurance document language. It's like it's like that <laughs> highest possible. Writing. Highest possible language of text. <laughs> I'm looking at the netiquette guidelines I give our students, and some of these might be useful to adapt. I've got, you know, always be polite. There's no tone to printed text on the screen, so it's easier to read something as rude, even if the writer did not intend it to be. So the easiest way to prevent this is by being more polite than you would be talking in person. That's a great rule. I just I think it's a little long though. Yeah. Well, I was the default. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then for as an alternative to that first paragraph, I've got respect the opinions and experiences of others, even if your own is completely different. Yeah, I like that wording better. It just seems to simplify it. We should keep track of our re reworded version. So let's um I just feel like if there's a default, it should be, you know, <clears throat> pretty uh, accessible to whoever wants to use it. Because like I think I feel like the majority of people are not going to change the default. Probably not. Yeah. At least not at the system level, maybe at the course level. People. Yeah, right. Okay, so um, the first sentence there, respect others' opinions and beliefs. You had a good um, alternative to that. Christina, what was that again? It was respect the opinions and experiences of others, even if your own is completely different. I still think we need bullets, don't you? I, I always try to go by my, I've got one other netiquette guideline. I don't think there's a room for it in here, but I just feel like sharing it because it'll probably make you guys chuckle too. Okay. Just be careful about posting anything when you are tired, sick, or having a terrible day. You're just <laughs> best at those times and you are more likely to come across as angry or rude. I like that one a lot. I don't know if I want to put it in as the default, but um, but it is it is appropriate. <laughs> yeah. Um, That's good advice. Does conversations have a saved draft? And... Here's a question. It does. Hmm. It does have a saved draft hmm. option. Um, if the school just has a um a standard, uh longer version Statement. of this can't they can't we just link to it and just say you know please be aware that you've agreed to the school's guidelines on x and here's the, the link to the pdf that resides someplace else i mean you certainly could um but it requires people to actually click a link and go somewhere and read something yeah so right. usually it's a little more apparent more difficult if it's right there in your face versus having to go to a link to see it because people will be like, oh yeah, okay, I agree without reading it. I know I do that with like <laughs> stuff that, <laughs> do you accept all these terms? And it's like, you know. Yeah, you've lost your right to uh, actually sue somebody. Yep. Okay, so does respect the opinions and experiences of others, even if your own is completely different, adequately cover everything that's said in the above statement? I think there's a few things touched on above that are missing, but they're kind of hinted at. So I don't know how explicit we need to be.
you could even you know add on to what you have there with just um the word you know remember we are yeah I, I, I was rereading it three times. Perspective in, yeah. in, 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 so the next sentence then, if you disagree, you may critique the idea, but not the person. Does that, is that readable enough? Does, should we include that? I really liked that. I don't know about others, but I liked it. Yeah, I think it's appropriate because um, I think from an educational standpoint, you know, if, if they're talking about Hitler as the content, then they may talk about Hitler and that's fine. But if they're talking about someone else in their class, then that may, that may, might need to be hedged quite a bit. You know, let's keep the con content we're talking about about the concepts rather than you know landing accusations individually in, in the course or something I use inclusive language we need to state that separately I think we might want to rewrite that and um, I think we should rewrite it. Because inclusive language, if they don't know exactly what that means, if we're that teaching means. them that. Right. So we might want to well, how how would we best if, define if, that? Red, Red Country, Ohio, where inclusive language is considered, you know profanity. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How about just avoid attacking others? Uh, avoid. <laughs> Gosh, there's so many things you could get in trouble with. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm trying to like stop attacking um, your friends and neighbors there. Another way to say inclusively. Without like. The definition of inclusive language. language that avoids the use of certain expressions or words that might be considered um, to exclude particular groups of people. Which really isn't much clearer. Yeah. Um, I even just like the, the whole second half of that. Avoid assumptions about others, especially based on their perceived social groups or identities. It's just yeah. don't, don't uh, discriminate. <laughs> I did. It's I, really... I like that part. Too. Yeah. Um, and I would add in that as, as a preface to that, you know, be always be polite. Even if yeah. you don't. If we're talking to fifth graders. That's right. You're absolutely right. Always be polite. Very nicely done. So, sometimes short and simple does the trick. Always be polite. Um, cover the inclusive language point, or is that covered in the avoid assumptions? Just wondering if we need to say anything in there about don't use language that excludes others.
Anybody else? I'm just stuck on that inclusive language term. <laughs> that is that too eyebrow i just felt like i needed something in there to address the inclusivity statement can we simplify it a little and say maybe avoid expressions or words that may exclude particular people rather than they might be considered yeah yeah Are we happy with that version? That's good. So I will pass that along to Conversations Development Group and we'll um, get that updated text in there as the default. So we have um, a couple of JIRAs, it looks like. Um, that is one um, from Triage that we Okay. Go to this first one here. And Christina, do you want to get us up to speed on this one? Um, the one from Triage? Yeah. So, um, just the... The, the best way to describe it is actually through the screenshot that he attached. If you have a assignment that's graded using points, ungraded is null. If you've got letter, pass, fail, or check mark, it shows un, the word ungraded in the grade column rather than null. Hmm. So he created this JIRA. Um, this was created by uh, Andrews. But he created this JIRA just to uh, suggest that the points should match the others. I just raised the question of, you know, should points match the others or should the others match points? What is the desired? If something is not graded, do we want the grade to be null or do we want it to show ungraded? Well, it seems like the ungraded is more of a status than a grade. You know? The status of that particular submission is ungraded. But it's a status related to the grade, not the st uh, status related to the submission, which is what the status column actually is. Mm. Mm. Because the status column will show things like not submitted, submitted, saved as draft. Right. So that's like the student submission status. Hey, I think that that column is for the student, not for the, I mean, for the faculty, it's informational, but for the student end point of view, they would they see that their item is ungraded? Well, this they is the instructor. They don't get this table. Okay. This is an instructor table. 
Jennifer, just yeah. what I was asking is, what should all of them do? Should we change points to match the others, or should we change the other three to match points? I think I would probably prefer to see it all, or maybe not just blank, maybe like the little dash to show that it's empty. Because it's less text on the screen, it makes this table less text heavy. Yeah, Jennifer, I don't think students see this table at all. This is the instructor view of the submissions, correct? Yeah, you have to go into the grade. That's the instructor, okay. Yeah, students don't see this table. But since they, depending on the type, then points, check mark, letter, effect, we would change all of them to be not. It's nice to see the word that they didn't grade it, that it isn't just blank. I mean, or, hmm, Christina, you got me on this one. Should it be blank to save screen space? What does it look like? I'm, I'm good at asking the you <laughs> are. questions. Yeah, let's let's go look and see. I'm I'm very good at asking the questions that don't really have an easy answer. I love it. Uh, hopefully, one of these already has the assignments. Ah, that one's. Work your uh, oh, so different. Lots Some of language playing. Yeah. All right, well, I'll just add it. Oh, this is bothering me. I'm going to log in as a different user, maybe. Courses that don't have that. Add an instructor. I don't know if it's so. One doesn't have assignments. Well, that one doesn't either, but at least the site's cleaner. All right, so um, we need the assignment tool on the grade book. So if it's points, just a hundred. Right, so when you go to grade, this here is blank. Um, let's make one that's not a grid, but not, not points. We want this one to be letter grade. Right, so we go into this one. It's ungraded. You know, I so rarely make things non-points that I don't really look at that screen very much. Um, but if I recall correctly, like anytime there's a submission, it'll say 
submitted, not graded, or something like that. Isn't that true? So when you submit something, it does say ungraded in the status column. That's interesting. That's very interesting. So, yeah. I mean, it seems like having ungraded here is a little bit redundant. Redundant, yeah. Look at you, Christina, making it hard. <laughs> Send chocolate and I'll go away. <laughs> We should give you chocolate for coming up with a really good review of it. I like it. I think it gives more more screen space because of this, and you've completely changed my mind. So I'm now with with this. So send more chocolate, and I'll keep looking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I would I would say that we lose the ungraded in the grade column. Agreed. Anybody else? Other dissenting opinions? Once, going twice. So, um, All right, so I'll, I'll put a, a note on that JIRA after the fact. Right now, so um, we'll move on to the next one, which is, um, I think this was one, one that was sent to us by the UX group, maybe, I think, I think it was. Anyway, um, okay, submit attachment link broken in new grading page and assignments. Oh, okay, I remember this one now. Um, so I think Earl was the one that had asked me to put this on the agenda. So he said that there was some confusion over like what the links should look like over here when there's an attachment. Um, I guess people were trying to figure out how to download the file versus display the file. Um, and there was one suggestion to make them buttons. And then there was another suggestion, I think, to um, did you need two links? Like I think this one tells you which one you're viewing, but this one does too. Um, I'm not sure what this was. He said something about people were trying to copy that link. I, I think she was trying to figure out why it was broke. So trying to show that it was not giving a link to the file. So initially, I think her, her concern was that link at the top works to download, but the link under submitted attachments didn't. She wasn't aware that if they submitted more than one attachment, that submitted attachments was originally used just to toggle between them. Okay, I get it. So I think then the question was, the submitted attachments is a lot more visible. Yes. So if someone is trying to download, it's not always obvious how they should. I thought there was a picture somewhere. Oh, yeah, this one had like some little download buttons. 
I think that was a proposed fix to add. So which version does this group prefer? You like the, the download buttons here, or do. do you like, um, let's see, this was another way to go. This one still doesn't make it clear where you go to download. Right, it just gives the name of it. I like the download as it's a, as it's yeah. a button that's used in mobile as well. And yeah, that, that's a very yeah. obvious download button. I like that one as well. So, um, so these would still stay then as links for viewing. Does that make sense to people to have that be? A, you know, you toggle between the submission attachments. Mm -hmm. Or does that need to be called out in some way? I, to me, it's kind of obvious. If I was seeing a list of submitted attachments and one was showing up, I'd click the other file to switch between them. Yeah. Is that an issue for accessibility? Or does a, a screen reader indicate this is a file you could download? The button here? Um, yeah, I guess. Yeah, that's right. Uh, well, I, I guess it does. I would think it would have to be labeled so that you know which file it's downloading. But okay. um, it comes right after that file, so it would read the file name and then the download button. Right. Whatever the Good. text is for that. And it does, the view up here, even though it's not super noticeable, um, would also help screen readers know which one they're currently viewing. Yeah. Yeah, I like the download buttons, too. I do too. Mm -hmm. That's the best of the, the bunch as far as it does make it a lot more clear where you go to download. All right, so we like the buttons. Yeah, Jennifer said it had came up for her this week too. Um, like for it. Download. Right. Should we write up the that there was concern about the um uh, accessibility on that button? But it, and that is labeled properly. Uh, okay. How, how would you phrase that? Review for accessibility. <laughs> Review, you know, just that the that the screen reader goes in that order, and and that label is yeah. for that. Thoughts? We've got about 10 minutes left. We can probably squeeze in one more JIRA. Um, do you guys have a preference as to which of these two you want to look at? I have no preference. Let's just go right on. All right, we'll go yep. to the next one. Stats most open file can be null. Okay. Huh. This is another one um, from triage. The trick is if you've got, say, TAs looking at the site stat and the most open file is one that is from another section or group that that TA is not a member of it shows them null. Okay. So it's 
So do TAs get the whole view of site stats or do they just see like they're on sections of site stats? I don't That's know. That's a good question. I don't know. Unknown. I just knew from looking at the test plan of this one on Monday. So um, Jesus was asking, he didn't know what would be the best option to solve this, you know, having some other string instead of the null, or do we remove null entries that would appear on that table? What other information do they get? I mean, is it just the file name? I don't know. <laughs> We never used TA. We never used TA, so I. Yeah, I mean, I'm just wondering if it could, what it would hurt to show them the file name, even if they don't have access to the file. And if they click, if they did find the file, I don't think it links directly to the file, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I think it's just the file name. You can't even open the file from there. Right from there. But it does say null because they can't see it. Yeah. Then it should say um, unavailable. Yeah, unavailable or can't access this. <laughs> access denied. Yeah, can't touch With this. Some graphic. <laughs> Little yeah, null look, it definitely looks weird. Um, so maybe. Uh, what's the message you get when you try to go to a site you, can't, you don't have access to? Does it just say site unavailable? Mm hmm. I think so. So maybe file unavailable? Mm -hmm. I just think is that. Is that good? Are you happy with that? Do we want it like removed completely? Did he offer any? We remove the null on entries. So what would you? I don't think removing the null entries would be the answer because it's obvious there's files open. So yeah, it seems like it would just introduce most. confusion. Yeah. So yeah, we don't want to obscure the data, but you know, if the person you doesn't have, have access, access, then it just says unavailable. You don't have access. So, all right. So I'll put um, we like file unavailable instead of null. That's great. So let's see. Do we think we have time in four minutes? Four so minutes, we can do it. Let's go. Yeah, yeah we can look at. It. All right. Rubrics. Um, external SAMGO quiz items with the rubrics don't show the rubric in the grade book. I put TNL on this one a couple weeks ago after triage because I think it is actually a non issue that needs to be a closed as a won't fix. Okay. Um, he's saying that um, you should be able to see the rubric for a test in the grade book with the associated gradebook item. But in the comments, Andrea and I both pointed out, you know, you have multiple questions, right. rubrics, you've got multiple graded rubrics, and you can have different rubrics for different questions. Right. Um, I think it's related to a misunderstanding about tests and quizzes. The other week at the core team meeting, um, I kind of got to prove Earl wrong. <laughs> that doesn't happen very often. Oh, <laughs> you should get like a badge or something. <laughs> Earl was um, operating under the assumption that tests and quizzes worked like assignments with rubrics, that you linked the rubric to the test. 
Yeah, no, it's to the question. It's to the individual test question. To the so question. I, and that you could have different questions, different rubrics for different questions within a single test. Yeah. So let me ask a question. Then how does that work when you're providing assessment score on a rubric question, when you have multiple questions that has the assessment linked to the gradebook? That's where this, that's why I think this is a, needs to be closed as a <laughs> one issue yeah. because yeah. I, I don't think it can be done. Yeah. Well, what I'm thinking is if you go through and you score oh. something with a rubric and you go to the next question, it's just going to overwrite whatever the score is that you had in the prior rubric. Well, wouldn't oh, wow. it just enter the score from the rubric in the points for that question, and then you move to the next question, you get a new box for points? Yeah. The, the rubrics in tests and quizzes are tied to the question, so each question can have its own rubric. Right. But then if you have a number of points that are, I assume if you're not thinking about how you're doing the design, and you make the rubric uh, an amount of points that is over and above what you want the overall assessment to be worth, I guess that's not even a problem, is it? Mm -mm. You, I mean, you would end up with a weird score, but yeah, I think we would let you do it. But yeah, because okay. also too, if you're manually grading, you can uh, put in a yeah. points over the over the value. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think this one's a non-issue because I don't think there's any way to do it. You can't show like 15 rubrics for one item, but you could potentially have that many. Um, in a quiz if you had 15 questions with different rubrics. Well, here, here's an idea that just popped into my head. Could you? You've got the light box that pops up with the rubric. So it would say rubric, you know, question one. If there was next and previous arrows, click, click, click. See question two, mm -hmm. question three, question four, question five. Mm. That would be a nice way to display it. But mm -hmm. I, I think I think Adrian's head would explode <laughs> trying to make that happen because I know he's always like it needs to be a one to one association. A Adrian's uh, the one who put in this request, therefore he wants it. Well, maybe, maybe. Um, or, or it's possible he was operating under the same assumption that Earl was. Yeah. No, well, not we can we can put that. It needs to either be closed as a non-issue if there's no way to, to do this, or our suggestion of you know the light box where you go next, 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 and view each individual, um, which would be preferable because then you would get all the feedback. Um, but I don't know if there's a way to do it. Mm -hmm. If there was, though, that might help be a step toward um, a feature request that I've heard from a few people where they want to attach more than one rubric to something. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah, I have some instructors now that when they want to have more than one rubric in assignments, they'll actually just pair it together in a single large rubric and like with discussion forms. So he'll go through and he'll actually assess their initial post, but then he leaves a portion of the rubric blank until after they have actually done their replies. And then he uses the same rubric to actually score the replies. Yeah, it's a little weird though because it's it, well, it's a little weird because the students don't get the feedback about their initial post yeah. until after he's actually finished the scoring of the whole thing. The instructors I have who want to attach two rubrics want to do it for assessment. So one rubric is about actually giving the students a score, and mm -hmm. the other one is you know trying to match that you know final paper to the course learning outcomes, and then yeah. we achieved those, and then exporting those rubrics for assessment. So they yep. don't necessarily want the students to be able to see that second half. That's it's not fair. Less. That's nice. All right. So I'll put that in as a suggestion. This is definitely our um, preferred solution. But um, if, if they can't do that, then it should be closed for now. Yeah. Or, or kind of put on hold in favor of the other. All right, so we are actually over time. So um, we'll, we'll go ahead and wrap up here because I actually have a, a another meeting that I think I'm a couple minutes late for. So. <laughs> See ya. Thanks um, so, so much, thank Wilma. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, guys. And I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Yeah, we'll run to the other meeting with the alongside people. Yep. <laughs> you are currently the only person in this conference.